dun 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 He's a lo-fi horror guy. Yeah, he's kind of a guy, but he is so lo-fi, lo-fi horror guy. Yeah, Lo-Fi Horror Guy has been recorded in front of a live studio audience. And three, two, one. What is going on, everybody? It's your boy, the Lo-Fi Horror Guy. Today on Growing On You Live, episode number five. I have got one of my favorites uh, as far as authors go, as far as directors go. Uh, one, of my, one of my favorites of all time that I've just loved his stuff for uh, years now, Mr. S. Craig Zoller. Craig, thank you so much for joining me today, man. Uh, my, my pleasure, uh, and, and thanks for your support. Uh, very much appreciated, and, and uh, glad you reached out. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So basically, uh, now, normally my, my interviews go, I have a little bit of a setup for, uh, you know, just a couple of questions here, some things here, a little fun things toward the end, but we are going to be plugging something today. So I'm just going to dig right into uh, the interview here, and we're going to start, and, uh, you know, if, if you're all set, we're going to get going, man. Go for it. All right. Uh, so my introduction to your work was Bone Tomahawk. That was the, the first thing that I watched. Uh, and since then, I don't know how many times I have watched. Uh, and then Brawl and Cell Block 99. Uh, but after that, uh, I learned that you were an author. So my introduction to your books was Hug Chicken Penny. Uh, and then soon after, I also found The Narrow Caves. So The Narrow Caves was presented uh, a, an audio state. What can you tell me about the Narrow Caves and its delivery as far as how we received it? Huh. Uh, let me be diplomatic here. Uh, mm -hmm. So Narrow Caves was uh, a script I wrote a bunch of different versions of in the late, uh, late 90s or early aughts. And it was the piece that got me representation at United Talent Agency and, and led to uh, me changing careers from catering chef who was writing shit and uh, playing in death metal bands to a writer who was writing shit and playing in death metal bands. <laughs> and um, so there have been a ton of different versions of it. And I'd spoken with uh, Dallas Sonye, who is my manager and producer on all these movies and a uh, man behind uh, Fangoria and Rebeller at this time, uh, you know, as, as well as Cinestate. And I spoke mm -hmm. to him about, us taking narrow caves around to, uh, you know, try and find a director. But when mm -hmm. I looked at the piece, and I'd not looked at it for a very long time, I thought it needed a lot of work. So I did a revision uh, that is the version that's out there, and he came up with this idea of the audio state. So to be clear, uh, I, I've never listened to a book on tape. It's just not okay. how my brain works. If, I'm, if, if there's a lot of descriptive prose, I'm going to read that more slowly because I build the world. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I write pretty stylized dialogue, so it's pretty difficult to pull off in a natural way, which is why I need to find the right performers to do it. Uh, sure. So I think the Narrow Caves audio book experience has um, some sequences that really work, others that don't work quite as well. But it was conceived of as a movie, so that's always how I see it. And at some point, uh, he and I intend to get it going that way. Okay. All right. I mean, you know, it was one of those things where in, in, uh, I was reading Hug Chicken Penny, and then I was, you know, discovering some more of your stuff. At the time, I'd had Audible. Um, and for some of the longer books, you know, I guess uh, when, when it gets into to reading in particular, my forte isn't something where I go and I pick it up, you know, and it's, it's – uh, it's, plus of a thousand pages, you know, it's just possibly uh, an undiagnosed ADHD or something. <laughs> right. But, you know, it's just kind of one of those things where it's like, it, it gets a little overwhelming for that. So then I saw the audio, you know, the audio state, and I'm like, oh, cool. Well, then I'm listening to it, and it's like a movie. It's got, you know, in a sense, a, a score right. to it and the background and everything. Um, yeah, I did, I did the score with my uh, composing partner, Jeff Harriet. So that music is ours. And as I said, like, I'm not the target audience for an audio book because other than that, uh, where I weighed in and, and tried to get it closer to what I originally envisioned, I've not ever listened to them because my brain doesn't work that way. I, uh, as I said, when I read, I slow down with stuff to visualize and might pause. A movie is immersive and is showing you uh, stuff, and, that, you know, that's a different kind of experience. But 
audiobook is just it's just not for me. So I think okay. uh, you know I've, I I know people uh, who listen to those often and have really enjoyed the piece. And you know I've I've seen some some positive reactions and some negative ones, but it's just not my uh, it's not my thing. Uh, okay. But if if the prose is there, uh, it's not all for me. It's not all to be read at the at the same speed. Uh, much the same way dialogue should not all be delivered at the same speed. Sure, sure, okay. Now, as far as your books, though, um, generally, I mean, at least from what I've what I've found, they're generally around like three hundred pages. So, with with the length, um, you know, the reader can't deny how incredibly descriptive you remain in your books. It's not something where it has to be a ton where I can sit here and literally feel like. I'm sitting in the seat that such and such is in. I'm smelling what it is that they're smelling. I'm tasting. Is it a conscious decision to keep your book shorter? I, I mean, to me, the, the uh, it's not a decision to keep them shorter or longer. A, a an approach with books and something that's enjoyable with books is there aren't going to be other uh, parameters set on the piece at a later date, like mm-hmm. a run time or how much time do you have to shoot these sequences and that sort of stuff. So okay. the, the word count on most of them is around 90,000, which is, uh, I think, just straight up average. I don't, okay. I don't think that that's short. I don't think it's long. Hug Chicken Penny is short. That's more novella length. That one is half as long as the other ones. And my upcoming novel, The Slanted Gutter, is a little bit longer. That one's probably 111, 112. So that one is a chunk longer and would be longer than uh, your average book. But I think that these, uh, I think that these lengths are sort of typical, uh, and that length, for whatever reason, winds up being a very good amount of time for me to tell my story, whereas mm-hmm. with screenplays, it's a constant struggle to keep them in the confines of a normal movie as I – my process is, is one of just discovery and surprise, and I chase down those leads. But, uh, yeah, I mean, Bone Tomahawk and Brawl Cell Block 99 are both quite a bit longer than the average movie, uh, mm-hmm. and yet they're, they're the two of the shortest screenplays I've written in the last five or six years. I mean, the last two that I, that I finished were both about 190 pages. So they, these, are, okay. these are movies that would be over three hours. So right, for whatever right. reason, the length of a novel is something that I naturally in in my storytelling land on, uh, okay. whereas the screenplay is a bit of a fight. Okay, okay, I got it. And I mean, by no means is that a slam as far as, like, your books-wise, perfect for me. When I go and I watch your movies, there, you know, some, some mention about the length or whatnot, they're sure. uh, bo- both, both ways for me as the viewer, as the, you know, the, the, the taker of the, the product that's being given – I absolutely love it. So I appreciate it and, uh, you know, absolutely a round of applause to it. Um, cool, but thanks. so from your books to your movies, uh, your material varies as far as, you know, different genres. Uh, and then your latest being a graphic novel, The Forbidden Surgeries of Hideous Dr. Divinis, uh, which is up for pre-order right now on Amazon, correct? Yes. Is it just Amazon or is there other places you can snag it? Uh, that- there is another... <laughs> There's a, there's a link to a store that I have that I sent around in, in, a, in a promo, uh, but Amazon, I think, is just is the, the simplest way to go and, and where, where everyone is there. But if you go to uh, a Floating World uh, uh, website, you will, you'll probably see uh, another link. Oh, okay, sweet. I mean, I snagged it on Amazon, but I just didn't know if there was other spots that had it up. But I, I think Amazon is a good and, and, and reliable place to go there. Uh, okay, then, sweet. You know, and then that money can go into Bezos' pocket, so we can uh, we can have a nice <laughs> rocket that'll take us to another planet. Right, <laughs> right. Let's right. fund the right. billionaire if you want to right. get us off of this <laughs> pandemic planet. Right. What uh, What can you tell us about the forbidden surgeries? I'm I'm dying to hear about it. So, uh, yeah, my first interest, uh, my first artistic interest was illustration, and I, I went back and forth, and continue to this day to go back and forth in terms of, you know, consuming a lot of animation and consuming a lot of uh, comic books, uh, graphic novels, manga, comic strips, all that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this is something I always knew I wanted to do and feel it's fundamental in what I do, even as a writer. It's one of the reasons that my books 
and scripts are so detailed, uh, if I was called upon to draw any of the characters or draw any of the settings or vehicles or weapons or moments of violence, I could. And uh, this was the fundamental interest of mine that never, never went away. And, you know, at various points in my life, I, I saw, you know, I have all these markers of, okay, I now have a three-picture deal with Warner Brothers. Let me celebrate. I'm going to go get a, an original page of art from Watchmen. Or I've just sold this script. Let me get these Chris Ware uh, original art pages. Or this Graham Ingalls page from Haunt of Fear, an E.T. comic from the 1950s. So it was always there sort of as a reward of, for my movie successes were these pieces of original art. It's just a very uh, – it's something I savor and, and look at every day. And, um, and the interest never went away. So after making the third movie, which was uh, Dragged Across Concrete, I felt like, okay, I want to do something different next. And I've been reading a lot of comic books, all different kinds. Uh, but particularly, I was exploring all of the pre-code horror comic books that weren't EC comic books. Because, you know, every, every comic book reader who's remotely interested in horror will have read some, if not all, of the EC comic books, Tales from the Crypt, Haunts of Fear, mm -hmm. um, Vault of Horror, and are familiar with that style. But I knew that there were things uh, out there that I'd, not, that I'd not read that were from that time period because there was this whole movement uh, going on at the time. So I really just started to investigate all this stuff and look into all these other titles. Like, uh, this magazine is haunted and Weird Mysteries were two of my favorites. Uh, there's Weird Terror, uh, Witch's Tale, Black Cat, Tomb of Terror, a lot, lot of horror titles. Mm -hmm. And... As is often the case with my artistic process, when I really immerse myself in something, I start to see these are the tropes I would embrace were I to do one. These are the things I would discard were I to do one. And yeah. this is the process that led to me writing my first Western, uh, Brigands of Rattleboards. Uh, mm -hmm. I had just seen 17 Westerns in the theater. And through that process... <laughs> I, through that process, I came up with what I would keep and what I would discard. So, similarly, sure. I read all of these horror comics, and at the end, uh, and, and a bunch of science fiction ones, and, and a bunch of, you know, and, and a ton of Donald Duck, uh, like Carl Barks and Don Rosa, Donald Duck. But at the end of this, <laughs> I, I just started to conceive um, this comic book, Forbidden Surgeries of the Hideous Dr. Davinus. And... Yeah. Uh, I, you know, it looked like this would be the time for me to do it. I knew I wanted a little bit of a break. Where there was a big lag time between finishing Dragged Across Concrete and when it got its American release. As mm -hmm. you'll know, the, the premiere at Venice was like uh, August maybe 2018, and the movie didn't come out till March um, 2019. So there was this yeah. lag time. And, and the productions on those movies, on, on all three movies, were difficult each harder and more miserable than the last. So the idea of just working on something at home and it being a completely artistic uh, and creative experience rather than movies, which are uh, very much managerial past a certain point, uh, seemed appealing to me. So all okay. of this led to me deciding what kind of story I wanted to do, which was horror, writing it out as a, as a short story, and then doing breakdowns and sitting down at the table and doing a bunch of practice pages uh, because I'd not done any real illustration or, or drawing for, for a lot of years. Like, I've done a couple of covers for my epic metal band and my uh, black metal band. Uh, mm -hmm. But outside of that, I hadn't drawn consistently since I was in college, which I graduated in 95, uh, when I was taking animation courses, which was... Uh, one of my focuses in film school. So oh, okay. I was, it wasn't that I was rusty. It's like there was, there was nothing that had even gathered rust. It had been so <laughs> long since I'd done any drawing. And I just trained myself and said, I know, I know it's not going to look great, but I, but I also know how to break down the story and tell it in a compelling manner, and I'll do the best that I can, and no matter what, I will finish it. And, uh, and that's how I went about it. 
Okay. All right. Awesome. I mean, and going along with that, I, I find, you know, through listening to interviews and, and checking out your stuff, uh, you like to surprise yourself in your work and challenge yourself to take concepts that you're a fan of, uh, ultimately kind of fine tuning them, putting your own special touch, uh, with, with each project you take on, um, or do, I should say, uh, what surprises came from the forbidden surgeries, uh, you know, just in the, in the process of it all. Well, the, the writing of it wasn't very different than writing anything else. Okay. Um, I, uh, it's, you know, whether I'm doing a screenplay or a book w- might determine how much uh, prose I put in there. I mean, in, in a screenplay, I'm not going to write in much detail about what's going on in a person's mind, because mm-hmm. unless you have voiceover, uh, that's not going to come through. I'll put enough in there so that the actor knows, and okay. I've always been, you know, complimented by uh, the actors uh, with whom I work with regards to the clarity of motivation for the characters. And oh, okay. very, very infrequently do I get a what's my motivation uh, question because it's clear on the page. Uh, and uh, so I knew in, in terms of me drawing this comic, like I need to have clear beats because they need to be things that I can render as an artist and uh, not count on a bunch of extremely subtle character work to bring across. So it was something I was aware of during the writing process. And then during the drawing process, I saw something that is different from filmmaking in terms of translating uh, a written story into, a, into another medium, uh, was my ability to be able to tell things clearly with a single picture or put extra stuff in the background. So there was a little bit more improvisation in that way where I could throw a character in the background and have them make a comment uh, and, and that, that's not going to happen that much on set uh, because you're hiring everybody and you're not going to just pull a bunch of random people and stick them in the background and have them start saying dialogue. So uh, there was some fun discovery that way. And then the writing process is usually where I'm making those discoveries. And whether it's a book or a movie or this story that turned into a comic, all the surprises were there, and, it, and that was typical to my normal process of, Oop, didn't know this character was going to get killed right here. And, <laughs> and, and, that's, and that sort of thing. And, oh, not exactly sure how this is going to end. Let me find out. Uh, okay. And, you know, and, it's, and then you get to look at it because, for me, it, was, it took about three weeks to write the story. Then it was four and a half months, uh, you know, generally sitting 12 hours a day at the drawing board and, and doing one page a day to actually tell this story, which is about 100 pages. Uh, right, so okay. It, it's, a, it's, like a, it's a workload um, uh, that, that exceeds that of writing a single novel um, for, you know, for certain in terms of how long the days are and how many days I spent on it. And uh, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very happy with it. It doesn't mean I don't have criticisms for it because, of course, I do. Mm-hmm. But uh, it was a very intense, uh, and challenging experience, and it's been cool. I mean, uh, we, you know, we've gotten some nice blurbs from some indie comic people, uh, and uh, I look forward to it getting out there. And I am currently working on uh, my second graphic novel. So, oh, damn, okay, uh, awesome. I plan on continuing to do. For sure, okay. What was it, I mean, you kind of touched based on it, but what was it as far as for business surgery that made you decide you wanted it to be a comic uh, as opposed to a book? Well, it's 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 it, it, it's actually so was, it, was it initially the thought that you were this is what I was going to do. Yes. Okay. Toy, All right. Toy gotcha. Speed. I knew I wanted to do a comic, and mm-hmm. I knew I wanted it to have a bunch of various elements, and you know, taking some of the vibe of the pre-code horror comics, and mm-hmm. then also the simplicity and clarity of Chester Gould, Dick Tracy, and Carl Carl Barks you know, Donald Duck to have the, you know, characters really read off of the page in a very immediate way. Uh, and then just, you know, a synthesis of all this different stuff, you know, stuff I like, like Frank Miller uh, and the Canadian cartoonist Seth, just kind of bringing in all these different things. And sort of like with my movies, there's so many varied influences from, ver- from really different, uh, you know, types of films. Uh, the end result, I think, is something unique. Okay. All right. Sweet. Sweet. So now touching on this because this was a graphic novel, uh, and you know, I, I so in the in the the metal community and the music community, there's a term called a poser. All right. So right. so 
from from my standpoint, the extent for comics goes, I have uh you know kind of like the novelization for horror movies. I have a huge collection of those. I have some Toxic Avenger comics, you know, different things like that. But now, from you being an avid reader, a lover, what would you say are three of your favorite comics and or comic series? That you know, if you were just recommending to somebody, even to say myself, that you're like, man, you have to, you have to read these. What would they be? Uh, I read a science fiction comic book very recently called The Eternot, uh, mm-hmm. and I don't know how to pronounce this guy's name. Let's say Oesterheld and Lopez <laughs> are, the, are the two the two people behind it, and that is so smartly written. Like, take the best. Outer Limits episode you've ever seen, and then make all of the characters significantly smarter, and then uh, render everything with a gorgeous, heavy shadow um, uh, brush, and uh, deliver a piece of science fiction that's true, scientifically minded science fiction. So I think that's that's an incredible that's an incredible piece. Um, you know, it's I I. I there's a there's an uh, Osamu Tezuka book called Ode to Kirohito, mm-hmm. which is about 800 pages, uh, but reads very quickly because of the style that he draws in. Okay. And there's a lot of experimental stuff, a lot of really brilliant stuff there. So I would recommend that as well. Uh, how about there's a there's a comic called Wimbledon Green by Seth. This is the Canadian cartoonist I mentioned. Sure. And so this will give you a really kind of different sense of what comics can do insofar as uh, it's a story sort of shaped and set up and told a little bit like Citizen Kane in which you're getting this fragmented account that is the biography of, of you know, the protagonist, in this case, a, a fictional protagonist. And through all of that, uh, you really get a, you get a, a, a funny and at times tragic uh, and at times dramatic and at times suspenseful story that is the biography of, of this person's life. So those are three I'll recommend, partially because they're not as well known as some of the things uh, that are out there. I mean, I am very much behind, so this will be my fourth recommendation, this short little list. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the Alan Moore Swamp thing, uh, Alan Moore and, and Dave Gibbons uh, on Watchmen, uh, the first four Sin City books by Frank Miller. Uh, I, I, those, those, things are, those things are terrific. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, I mean, most of, the, most of the EC horror and science fiction comics are worth your time, uh, as okay. is almost everything by Jack Kirby in the 1970s. Uh, but okay. that a little bit more for the explosive visual style and creativity uh, than the writing. Uh, but all all of that stuff is all of that stuff is terrific. Uh, okay. If you really if you really want to kind of dig in a different way in comic history, the uh, Carl Barks uh, Donald Duck stuff, which uh, certainly most of my life I was you know the thought of me reading uh, three four. 5,000 pages of Donald Duck stories didn't, didn't seem appealing, but I have, and you can see why this guy is considered a master in terms of putting motion on the page and the simplicity of his drawings, but also the, uh, the, the quality with which they're rendered. So that's, that's more than the three you asked for, but um, it, it's hard, and I could, and I could recommend <laughs> it for five hours. So right, right. I'll leave it there. Okay. Okay. I mean, it's, it's kind of a common theme as far as this show too. Cause like typically if I have somebody that's more into horror movies, somebody, if I, if I have somebody that's in the music community, I ask them, you know, for what's your three, you know, kind of like I mentioned your three favorite, uh, horror movies off the top of your head. Cause it's kind of a thing too, to where, you know, different people have different interests and they have certain things where it's like, Oh, well you should check this out. You should check this right. out. And so it's kind of fun where, you know, I, I, I by no means a Mr. Comic, uh, I've read plenty and I, I love a lot, but you know, it's also interesting to hear some of the ones that I haven't heard. And it's like, yeah, I can go check those out. Sweet. Right. So I'll give you, I'll give you my, I'll give you my five favorite movies. Okay. Uh, five oh, favorite horror yeah. movies. My five favorite horror movies would be, uh, night of the living dead, uh, Rosemary's Baby, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Lost Highway, and Freaks. That would, those would be my that. Those five have been my five favorite horror movies for a very long time. So that's actually 
uh, a, a list I'm, I'm ready to rattle off whenever, <laughs> whenever prompted or given the opportunity. Those, those five movies are ones I, I return to regularly and always hold up and always yield uh, new little new little moments and just you know are are fantastic and and different uh, different and unique experiences. Sure. Now, are are you a fan of Tom Savini's uh, remake of The Night of the Living Dead? I never saw it. Um, Holy moly! Are you a fan? It's good. It's very good. In in comparison to remakes, you know, so to speak. Uh, even among, I mean, the horror community, it's it's actually well regarded. It's a really really good remake. Yeah, it's it's tough. Uh, it's tough with that one. That one is <laughs> on such a pedestal for me. Right. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I I don't. I mean, the possibilities are there. I think right. you know one one doesn't have to look any further than Cronenberg's version of The Fly to see that. Uh, right. you know, a couple a couple decades later, you 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 really might do something amazing and different with the material. Uh, so there are, there are some good ones out there, but in general, uh, I would rather see original material. I mean, and I, I say this having you know something like fifty screenplays that I've written uh, and tons of them. I have six alone sitting at Warner Brothers, uh, right. where they're just happy to keep cranking out. Um, superhero stuff and, and remakes. Uh, but who knows? The, the, uh, Night, Night of the Living Dead, I'll, I'll, put it on my, uh, I'll put it on my list of things to keep an eye out for. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things where if you keep in mind how monumental the original movie was, you know, if you keep in mind as far as not in comparison but just sitting down to enjoy something for what it is, it's really good. Fair enough. Yeah, so uh, you mentioned villains, so this is going to segue perfectly into my next question. Uh, one of my favorite aspects of your stories are the villains. Uh, I find that no matter what, whether it be your movies, your books, uh, I truly generate a natural disgust for when I'm supposed to be disgusted. Uh, I cringe when I'm, I feel like I'm supposed to be cringing and it's a natural thing. It's not a forced, you know, feeling. I feel like everybody that enjoys your stuff gets that same thing. Uh, that said, with these tools at hand, what comic book villain would you favor making an origin story for? Oh, um, so let me. The, the the short answer is I'm interested in creating my own material, and okay. I've I've been involved with probably three pieces that I didn't originate. One of them is Puppet Master, the Little Little, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. that yeah. one I approached because I thought like I came at it from the standpoint of well, why would someone make these, and and what would be their purpose, and then reverse engineered something that already existed. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, uh, it's, it's, yeah, I, I don't really look at, I don't really look at other people's material and, and, and think of that very often in, okay. in the case, in the case of that piece I, I did and, you know, something that I grew up with like, uh, RoboCop and Rambo mm-hmm. were two where I, I had, um, you know, pitches, I had a pitch for, you know, how I thought the final uh, Rambo should go, which is very different than what we saw. And, <laughs> and I had a pitch for RoboCop that, and I almost became the writer of that remake, and then it went to somebody else. So oh, my God. Occasionally, occasionally, there, occasionally, which I've never seen, occasionally there are pieces out there uh, where I'll come up with my own take, but there isn't, there isn't really a character that I look at where, where it's my desire to go out and and come up with something. A lot of times, as, as was the case of Puppet Master, I saw all of these things that were sort of hinted at, and like, well, how can I bring this all together in a way that makes sense? Like, oh, they've made these things to infiltrate people, to infiltrate society in, in Nazi Germany, and mm-hmm. like hunt down the quote-unquote undesirables of the time. Like, that made sense as to why someone would go and make all these malicious puppets. And uh, so it, it, it came from that. But there, there isn't really... It's not really a comic book uh, villain uh, per se, but you know I'll look at something like Robocop or Rambo or even or even the Transformers and think of a way where you could reverse engineer the, the concept to be uh, maybe maybe tighter or at least more compelling to me. Right. Okay. Now, and I, I think it was uh, what I'm going to reference is I believe it was. Uh, Dragged across concrete. I was reading something as far as that 
initially it was sent back that they wanted to cut the movie shorter and you're like, no, this is, this is not what I agreed to. This is the movie that we're putting out. This is the movie that it is. That was kind of my, my idea as far as with the whole comic villain, just because I feel like it would be something great to see somebody just be like, nah, screw that. Like, this is what we're going to do. This is what I want to put out and is what's going to go out. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly, I'm, I'm approaching things from the standpoint of uh, I want to do things that I, that I find interesting and engrossing myself and also things I maintain uh, creative control over. Like there are, uh, you know, many potentially offensive or objectionable things in my, uh, in my books and uh, movies and, and now my, my first graphic novel. And it's, they're not for everybody. So right. Uh, right. Having, having stuff that is unique and, um, and, and taking some of those chances uh, uh, with your characters, I think, you know, I think that's some of what makes it stand out and stand apart from whatever else is out there. Right. Okay. All right. Got you. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. That's, uh, I mean, above and beyond a great answer. So <laughs> I, I appreciate, uh, I appreciate you hearing it out. Do you have time for a couple of questions or are you, uh, you all good? Give, uh, how about, how about two more? Two more. Okay, perfect. Actually, that's, that's where we're at. So I just wanted to, I just so happened to look down at the time and this is flying by, uh, going awesome. So I just wanted to make sure it was cool with you. All right. Um, may it be, so may it be bone tomahawk with the, with the body split scene. Uh, let's, let's go race to the broken land with the inverted villain toward the end, uh, or the finger bit in the first act of congregation of jackals. There is certainly a, a, pushing of uh, violence that just goes to the next level. What are some things that you would say, uh, not necessarily reference, but kind of influence your work to push things to that level? Yeah, it it depends on the kind of violence I'm trying to accomplish. So let me say that the violence in Bone Tomahawk and the violence in Brawl and Subblock 99, for the most part, is very different violence. Yeah, sure. I think that the violence in Bone Tomahawk, particularly... Um, uh, the, the Deputy Nick sequence and some of the stuff towards the end that I'd rather not spoil in case uh, any, any of your listeners have not seen it, that violence is supposed to traumatize the characters and the viewer. And, it, and it's made to be that sort of experience. And, uh, you know, and, and from, from reactions I've read and seen and heard and, and angry and complimentary emails I've, I've seen, it seems like it accomplished... Uh, what I what I set out to do uh, for, for <laughs> yeah, many yeah. viewers. Uh, Brawl Cell Block 99, a lot of that violence is supposed to be cathartic. Now, at the same time, I'm taking it a little further than one might usually take it, so then there's a wince along with that, but a lot of that is a release, and most of that violence is being done by somebody uh, who the audience is going along with and has endured you know, a number of setbacks and tragedies with. So mm-hmm. that's, a different, that's a different kind of experience. So the violence in Brawl and Cellbox 99, in a way, to me, feels a little bit more like violence that I would see in um, Dirty Harry or Death Wish <laughs> uh, or Robocop in that, for the most part, most of the violence in those movies, obviously not sequ- you know, sequences when people are being victimized, but when the protagonist is hurting uh, the villains, uh, a lot of the violence in those movies, you're with the person, even if you morally question the person, uh, they are at least the lesser of two evils, if not the, the hero. Uh, the violence in uh, Bone Tomahawk, that's different, and I wanted that to put people in the headspace that I was in when I saw Irreversible, or have you ever heard of a Hong Kong movie called Men Behind the Sun? Oh, yeah. So that's the only movie I've ever had to shut off. I watched <laughs> it in high school. I got a VHS tape in some, you know, bootleg VHS market, and I had to shut it off because I was, I was getting sick. Yeah. So I, was, yeah. I was physically nauseated, and I had to shut it off, and then I watched it in pieces to kind of get to the end. But yeah. at that point, I've been a Fangoria gorehound for years with pictures from you know, Day of the Dead and Texas Chainsaw Massacre and From Beyond and all this stuff all over my room. But when I watched Men Behind the Sun, I was traumatized. And, <laughs> and it's done so dryly and it's done so well. 
and so coldly that that was that was that was a big influence on how I wanted to approach uh, the violence, in particular the the most infamous sequences with Deputy Nick and towards the end in, in Bone Tomahawk, which is this like dry clinical approach of this is what's going on. Don't overdo the sound effects. Um, mm-hmm. Don't punch in for a lot of close-ups. Try and use uh, less coverage if possible. Don't sell it with music. And I don't remember, it, it, it has been more than 20 years since I've seen Men Behind the Sun, but I don't remember being sold a lot of stuff with music in that. Like, I think, I think a lot of it just existed as it was. I, I could be wrong on that. Again, it's been more than two decades. But that was the approach with Bone Tomahawk. I wanted that to be traumatic. And so the movies that have movies that have traumatized me, uh, and, you know, irreversible, uh, and (laughs) men behind the sun or two that leap to that leap to mind. That Mm -hmm. was, that was the experience. Like that's not supposed to be enjoyable. Now, you know, the, the, the flat out gore hound who is not with the characters in bone tomahawk, the way, uh, I, I kind of intend, might just think, oh, this is awesome, look at all that shit that's happening to that guy. And that's fine. I'm not telling people how to enjoy it. It just wasn't the design of it. Whereas the design of the violence in <coughs> Brawl and Subok 99 was supposed to be uh, uh, cheering, m- moments that would make an audience cheer or applaud. And I've seen both of those movies with a lot of audiences. And... Bone Tomahawk, there's a lot of silence and or people walking out at those, <laughs> at those scenes. I've seen the traumatized people leaving the theater. And, and with Braun Subak 99, uh, the audience response was, was very enthusiastic. Every time I saw it, when uh, Bradley started to do uh, what needed to be done. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, you know, with that, with that particular scene, like you said, I don't want to spoil it or anything, but uh, out of the hundreds of movies that I have in my collection, uh, pulling out just a certain couple, that scene in particular is still, I actually, I watched the movie this morning. It's still one of those things that I have to try and tune out a little bit and just look away because it is just, I think part of it as well, along with the gore aspect of it is that I just don't expect that extreme coming at me and then it just hits you and you're just like holy shit yeah and that and that's supposed to be the <laughs> that's supposed to be the experience so extremity i mean you know in 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 today's culture a lot of people just think that extremity and gratuity are are the same thing uh for mm-hmm. me they're not uh and i can enjoy both or or dislike either depending on the context that that, that they're used but that's it, that's the point of it is it's supposed to go further and make you uncomfortable. When I wrote that sequence, I was uncomfortable and wondered if I had gone too far. And uh, oftentimes I have that reaction when I write some of these moments that people discuss, certainly the threat that the placid man Udo Kier gives to uh, Bradley when he visits him in Brawl and Subbuck 99. I wondered again if I had gone too far and and was uncomfortable with it, but that's some of the reason I left it, because it is unique to this experience. And mm-hmm. if I'm having that ex- reaction as the person who conceived it, uh, it seems like that would be similar, if not stronger, for uh, viewers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, that that is exactly what bleeds through. That's one of those things that just it, it holds on to you far after what you're watching and uh, even talking about uh, uh, Brawl and Cell Block 99, there's certain scenes that it's been a while since I watched it. And once I knew that, you know, you and I were going to be talk out, or talking, uh, I watched it again and I was just, you know, I get upstairs and I tell my wife, I'm like, holy shit, I forgot about this part. There's such and such and da 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 I'm like, oh my <laughs> God, you know, we're going to have to watch this. And so, yeah, it's, it's awesome. Those are certain the things, certainly the things that I feel like with your movies, it's, the product that you're getting is what was intended, kind of like, you know, reading about Bone Tomahawk that was pretty close to the final stage of what the, the script was, was what you actually saw. So I think that's what fans of your stuff really appreciate is the fact of we don't feel like it's some, you know, going through uh, courses and courses of editing and cut down. It's just, it's the shit that you want to be seen. And I mean, that's, that's one of the things that I personally appreciate so much about your stuff. Well, well th- thank you very much. That's, that's, that's nice to hear. And uh, if anybody wants any evidence, you go to my website, uh, 
the scripts for those three movies and, and a handful of others that I've written are on there. But for those yeah, three movies, yeah. you can see I shot what I wrote, and occasionally some things fell short uh, on, you know, uh, I didn't have enough time to do it or something didn't look right, and those scenes are gone. But these movies are ni- like 97, 98% accurate to those scripts, and someone will see that <coughs> uh, if they take a look at the script. They're, that's the blueprint for making it, and that, is, that becomes very necessary when you're doing mm-hmm. very ambitious things quickly particularly Bone Tomahawk, you know, which was uh, 20, 21 days of shooting uh, that movie. And clearly we should have had twice as much time, but that's what the budget afforded. So you got to, that, that script is, is what's pulling you through doing six, seven, eight, nine pages in a day is people being ready to deliver that. And of course you have discussions right. with all the performers and I, you know, and, and I, and I talk to, my cinematographer, Benji Bakshi, ahead of time when we figure out a plan. But it, uh, you, you need a very specific plan to do things that are this ambitious in the, in the time scale, uh, you know, in the time frame that we have. Okay. All right. Awesome. All right. So the last, last but not least, what I have to hit on really quick, and hopefully this doesn't uh, take too much time as far as answering, uh, but aside from being a director, author, cinematographer, uh, and a chef, you're also, as you've mentioned earlier in the show, uh, and something we have in common, actually. You're a drummer. You're in a black metal project called uh, Carnal Valley. and then you Carnal have... Valley, yes. Okay, Carnal Valley. I'm sorry about that. And then, no, no uh, problem. And then what I would consider a war chant metal project called Realm Builder. How, like, how did you get involved with, with, A, the drums, and, B, just these, these badass bands? Uh, well, first off, what kind of what drums do you... What do you play drums for? What kind of music? I am in a hardcore punk band. Okay. Yeah. So are you doing like a hardcore punk band where you're doing a lot of D-beat stuff or? Yeah, you know, like some uh, most, mostly fast, I guess, you know, just uh, in, in the vein of, let me, let me think here, uh, you know, just uh, floor time work and the hi-hats and real kind of in your face and real basic, but still just slap you in the, in the face and then uh, go and tell you to have a good night <laughs> send me uh, the email we communicated before send me send me a link i'll, ch- I'll check out your stuff i'm i'm a metalhead and sort of outside of that really into prog rock and soul uh and and jazz and a lot of a lot of synth stuff and some opera mm-hmm. so hardcore isn't my wheelhouse so much but occasionally i'll hear stuff i dig and there's obviously a crossover at the wolf brigade Okay. Okay. There, there are some crossover bands that are, are, are you know, Amoebics. Okay. Yep. Like that are like the crust punk kind of crossover that I that I can get into. But I, I like the uh, I, I like stuff that has more the the metal uh, uh, ambiance and uh, pushing pushing those sort of uh, alternate worlds. So I. Yeah. Um, okay. yeah I, I like I wanted to play music and had no. Uh, musical aptitude or training whatsoever and sort of taught myself to play drums and wasn't very good uh, and still to this day have problems with some things that are rudiments at the same time I can do, uh, you know, rolling bass, maybe not spot on if I'm trying to get like, you know, 97 hits, in, mm-hmm. you know, perfectly across, you know, eight, eight measures or whatever it is. Uh, so we'll need to clean up my work a little bit in the studio, but uh, I, was, I was always interested in playing in playing drums, and that was something I started with in, in high school. But I live in New York City now, and have okay. been, and have since I came here for uh, for college. Uh, and this isn't a great place to be a drummer. You're certainly not going to have a kid in your apartment unless you want people to bomb you. Uh, <laughs> so you need to go to a rehearsal space and rent out. Uh, uh, rent out a room and play in a kit there, uh, and then these are either beaten to hell or you're supplementing it with a fair amount of your own equipment, like I would bring in my Iron Cobra double bass pedal so that I could do double bass work. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I, very fortunate that the guy I write the music with for Realm Builder and did all of the songs and score for all three movies is a friend of mine named Jeff Harris. Jeff, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, and okay. we've been friends uh, since I was 13, and I'm now, what am I, 
40, 47 maybe. Uh, <laughs> we, we've, been, we've been friends for over 30 years, and he's a music professor. So when, oh, okay. I, when, when I get off beat, he lets me know. Maybe not in the most polite manner always, but, <laughs> but he knows. His, his sense of, of tempo is, is probably near perfect, and certainly his pitch is uh, perfect, if not super close. I mean, he'll work with uh, professional platinum-selling artists or opera singers and uh, oh, correct them all the time, uh, whether they want, want him to or not. So he's, he's a good friend. We musically co- collaborate uh, really well together for all these different kinds of music, synthesizer stuff, heavy metal, which we do with the Realm Builder Project, um, all the soul songs that are in Brawl Cell Block 99 and Dragged Across Concrete. We work on all this stuff together, and he really kind of shapes it. Like, I'll come up with a lot of core ideas, like the beginning bass line, and then mm-hmm. maybe the tempo, and then I'll sing some stuff, and then he'll sing in key, and then... He'll change the phrase, and then I'll add something. And then he'll add a harmony, and then I'll bring in a different instrument. And uh, so that's really how I've learned uh, to write music. And a lot of that process was with the band Realm Builder. And prior to that, we had another band called Wombat, which has some (laughs) not great material. And it's really hard to describe what it is. Let me just – how about progressive thrash at the end? And early and early on, before progressive thrash, sort of some clunky, um, not particularly well delivered hybrid of like death and black metal riffing styles with something with, with almost a new wave of British heavy metal style singing. It, was, it didn't. It, it, that didn't really work. Uh, but through, through a bunch of failed albums. And then uh, ultimately one that we think is pretty good, the, the final one, which was ambitious as hell and <laughs> sort of worked, we, uh, we conceived the idea of Realm Builder and, okay. uh, you know, and just started doing that. And it was something where its pitch is much better than mine, <laughs> but we decided I should be the singer, uh, just partly just because of the different qualities of our voices and, and the personality that I would bring. And so he, okay. you know, coached the hell out of me to get those performances and, and certainly did no small amount of correction to get them in line uh, <laughs> in terms of pitch. But it's, it's, a, it's a great working, you know, it's a great working relationship and we've done, you know, a lot of different albums together. But, uh, yeah, Realm Builder we conceived together after uh, the whole kind of failed uh, Wombat experience. And then Charnel Valley is the black metal project that I do with uh, my friend in... Uh, Michigan, uh, in Traverse City, uh, Marty Rickinen. And oh, he really? And I, yeah, he and I did. Oh, no shit. Yeah, he and I did both of those albums together. And the first one was, I mean, it's, we, did, we recorded that on a cassette and uh, literally had a mic that was, a, I don't even know what kind of mic this is. It looks like a trap for roaches or, or like a poster. <laughs> Or like a coaster you would put a drink on. We just take this one <laughs> mic to the wall. And although I lack accuracy, certainly with rolling double bass, I don't lack for power with my hitting. So we were able to get kind of a decent sound out of the kit with one terrible mic going directly into a cassette <laughs> that was just hanging on the wall. And because I Damn. hit hard enough, I was able to bring out stuff at the top. Again, all the errors are very apparent on that recording <laughs> because it was lo- it was. You know, my, my drum track was live to cassette with, with no fixes. Uh, and after we did that first one and, and uh, P- uh, Paragon Records put it out, we're like, okay, let's spend a little more time and do the next one a little bit better. And then we brought in Jeff Harriet to record that second uh, album uh, for Charnel Valley and, and got that out there and, and got some, some decent reviews. And, uh, you know, that, that, was, that, was a while, that was a while back, but... Uh, I wouldn't mind taking up that project at some point in the future as well. Yeah, but, for you know, sure. Wor- working on music is very, very enjoyable. It can be frustrating if you're missing a, you know, you miss your beat and ruin a ruin a good take. But uh, as compared to you know making movies where it's a lot of waiting and managerial stuff and constant money discussions, you know, being in the studio, uh, although there can be pressure and it can it can cost money depending on your situation. Uh, right. mostly creative. Like the proportion of creative to mundane is much higher 
with making an album uh, than it is with making a movie. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, that's sweet. <laughs> that's that's sweet. I you know it was just one of those things I came up on uh, that you were you were in a band I don't know some time ago uh, and then started looking into it and I'm like holy shit he plays drums too like that that is that's so wild that's awesome. But yeah, one of the questions I was going to ask you earlier was just mentioning because in uh, one of your books, one of your movies, you you do mention N- Michigan native. So let's it was is it because of uh, not Jeff but uh, your other buddy? Is that where that inspiration comes from? I, I mean, I've spent time there, so uh, oh, okay. Yeah, you know, I, 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 uh, Traverse City is a nice place. Yeah, for sure. That. Okay. Yeah, it's 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 uh it's enjoyable visiting him out there. So uh, okay. Yeah, I, uh, I I I have fond feelings of the Midwest in general. My girlfriend is from uh, Minnesota, and okay. uh, I have a bunch of friends from from around there. So uh, sweet, sweet. Yeah. All right. Well, man, I have taken up uh, more than the time that you allotted. I have had such a great time. Uh, this is really like not being corny a dream come true i truly <laughs> i truly appreciate you uh coming on and doing this man um uh, thank you so much is there anything you'd like to say just as far as plugs toward the end of the show here no i mean i i uh you know we, we've we've gone over we've gone over stuff i would say i'll just reiterate in terms of the comic forbidden surgeries of the hideous dr de venus you can you can pre-order it on amazon it would be great to support that and not really because I, I need the cash because I don't. Um, my screenwriting career is good, but the, the publisher of Floating World Comics, that's a comic book store, and this is not a good time for comic book stores. Right. And uh, supporting places like that, even if it's not my comic in this comic book store, that's a, that's a worthwhile thing to do. Like the things that we've taken for granted would always be there. Uh, maybe not all of those things will be there. So mm-hmm. uh, if, if if you if you don't if you're not that interested in in my in my first graphic novel, uh, but you are a comic reader, uh, now's now's a good time to support your store so that they can kind of make it through this. So, I'd, okay. I'd point that out, and then, uh, yeah, and and I have another novel coming out, The Slanted Gutter, uh, that's also up for pre-order on Amazon, and that, uh, yeah, that that one uh, that that one is 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 the piece that. Um, Several people have said I went too far who were on board with it. <laughs> I'm interested to see the reactions that that one gets when that goes out there. But, uh, you know, I, I appreciate your support and the support of people like you. The enthusiasm is nice. And certainly, uh, you know, during this uh, strange time in history, it's uh, nice to uh, see that my work is still resonating with people and have the opportunity to come on uh, a program like this and, and talk about it. And, uh, receive accolades. So uh, why not? So thank you very much. All right. Cool. I'm going to let you go. Stay safe. Uh, be careful out there, and you take care. I can't wait to uh, get your uh, new stuff, man. Cool. Thanks Thanks for the support and the opportunity. Have a good one. Yep. You too, man. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. He's a lo-fi horror guy. Yeah, he's kind of a guy, but he is so lo-fi, lo-fi horror guy. Yeah, lo-fi horror guy has been recorded in front of a live studio audience.